Welcome to this session, this panel discussion on women, innovation and intellectual property. We're delighted to be hosting this. This is the uh, third year in a row at the assemblies that we have had an issue, a, a panel discussion on women and one aspect or another of intellectual property. Uh, it's, of course, a an extraordinarily important topic because uh, we see that innovation now is the flavour of the month uh, all around the world and, and everyone is talking about innovation all the time, but not so much talk about uh, women in innovation. And um, all of the statistical evidence uh, indicates that we have really a great deal of progress to make. Some progress has been made, as my colleague Bruno Leferbe will indicate in uh, our statistical studies, but a huge amount of uh, progress still needs to be made. I have pleasure in welcoming, um, well, Samas Shamoon, my colleague, who's the head of our media and news and media section, will, will be moderating. You will introduce the speakers with you, but let me just briefly, um, uh, I'll leave Sama to introduce them. But uh, let me just thank each of the speakers for coming. We're really delighted to have you here and to have specialists who are addressing this. I thank also uh, our um, diversity uh, officer, specialist, Ka Kaori Seto, who's uh, here. Uh, and I would like to say that we have taken this issue extremely seriously at WIPO both because, of course, it's a major part of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's a system-wide commitment in the United Nations. <clears throat> but we also have a number of specific activities and programs ourselves, which range from uh, the introduction of a policy on gender equality in 2014, through to the, a network of uh, 25 gender focal points, uh, within the organisation. Of course, we participate in the system-wide uh, activities on, <clears throat> uh, on uh, uh, gender equality. We've done a lot of work, as I mentioned, Bruno will indicate, uh, in, uh, to try to get a, a better empirical basis of what actually is happening. Uh, and we do that through our World Intellectual Property Indicators. We, it's a feature of our PCT annual uh, uh, or yearly review. It's uh, now uh, an indicator that's included in our Global Innovation Index uh, also. Uh, and we have uh, quite a number of programs that promote the empowerment of women in intellectual property. So um, we are very much focused on this issue uh, as an organization and in our programs. We're delighted to have this panel discussion today. I, ask, I apologize and ask uh, for your indulgence, I have to leave for another engagement. Unfortunately, we have these conflicting engagements at the time of the of the assemblies. But it's nice to at least be here at the opening uh, and to wish you a very uh, interesting discussion, which I regret that I shall not be able to uh, hear. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Sama, who is going to moderate for us. Thank you. So we are. Um we are joined here by a very distinguished panel of speakers, and uh, though distinguished is a somewhat overused word, word in the world of diplomacy, I actually really mean it. Um, this is, uh, th as I said, distinguished panelists hailing from different backgrounds, but all with a single passion, and that for innovation. And the audience as well is equally distinguished. Uh, this is not a theoretical discussion. We have here a very interesting mix of brain power and willpower to really bring about change in the field of intellectual property in particular, and hopefully in the wider uh, 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 landscape of innovation. Uh, I hope we'll all leave this meeting with a better understanding of um, what can be done to ensure that everybody, everyone, women, men alike, can benefit equally in the innovation game. Very quickly, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. On my right is Ines Knapper, Knapper. Yes. Knapper from Germany. She lives uh, close by, so she's a resident in neighboring um, France. 
She describes herself as an innovation enthusiast and social entrepreneur. Her goal is to make the world a better place, and she's actually putting her money where her mouth is and trying to do just that through innovation by bringing like-minded people together to solve and address issues in the humanitarian world. She'll tell us about hackathons that she organizes, and uh, we've I've been privileged to have a conversation before, and it's quite exciting. Daniela Galindo from yes. Colombia. She's flown over from Colombia, and she is a living example how necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, Daniela is a recipient of multiple awards for an innovation that helps people with disabilities communicate better, and she'll give us a small demo, and I think you'll be very excited to see what she has to say on the question of innovation. Helen Lee, I would say, is a citizen of the world, originally from China. She's now a researcher at the University of Cambridge, leading the Diagnostics Development Unit, and she is a prolific user of the patent system. Uh, she joined academia following a highly successful career in the private sector, notably at Abbott Labs, uh, but also at the French National Blood Transfusion Center in Paris. We'll be hearing about her work, including her groundbreaking invection, uh, invention for a diagnostic test for a range of different infectious diseases. Bruno Lefebvre, our own Bruno, is a statistical analyst and one of our own gender champions at WIPO. And he'll walk us through some key data on work that WIPO has done in the field. Now I would like to stop talking and give the floor to our panelists and first of all ask them why they accepted our invitation to be part of this panel today. Daniela? Well, yes, you just press the button. Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here. It's my first time in Geneva. It's my first time in Switzerland. And I really appreciate this invitation. Um, I accepted this invitation because, well, me as an entrepreneur, I feel passionate about talking what I'm, I'm doing every day, that is stopping stereotypes. And this is one of the, one of that stopping stereotype. So uh, I would like to, during this discussion, to like to tell you about my personal uh, opinion about this stereotype uh, and my personal experience. Uh, thanks, Samar, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for having me here today. I understood uh, this is a very special uh, moment for you as well with the assembly here. Um, I can tell you it's also a very important um, moment uh, in the year for myself, because uh, tomorrow we will kick off with our humanitarian hackathon that we are organizing now for the fourth time um, at CERN. Um, the port is an association which is based in Switzerland. It's non-for-profit. Um, we are related to CERN because many of our members are working with CERN and are volunteering their free time and their brain power uh, to this uh, association to help bridging the gap between the humanitarian world on the un one side and uh, the innovation technology innovators on the other side. Um, and our event basically starts tomorrow, and this is why uh, my dress code is a bit unconventional. But I also tell you, uh, for innovation, you do not need a tie. So we try to be at a bit bottom up. Um, why I accepted to be here today, because I think um, diversity is an important topic. And OK, sorry. But I see that the balance is just one facet of it. So what we do with our humanitarian hackathons, we are not shaping only the challenges very thoroughly that we are asking the participants to work on, but we are also selecting our participants. So there is a huge range of hackathons, and don't know if you heard this uh, word ever before, it comes from hacking, so basically making things simpler, and marathon, where you have um, you are going over a long distance and you are having a trouble to reach your destination in time and quickly. So this is a bit of what we are doing. And um, there are a huge facet of, of those um, innovation events where you basically come to an event, you pitch your idea, you find like-minded people that are um, interested in your idea and help you over 24 hours to code something or to build something. But what we do with our association is we are um, trying to be on the other side of the scale. So we are um, running a curated hackathon where we have um, 
basically, um, we are, as I said, um, we are shaping the challenges together with the humanitarian uh, <coughs> challenge setters, be it um, international organizations or individuals. And then on top of those challenges, we see who can best benefit to this project and can maybe add value to, to the outcome of the project. And this is why diversity is very important and gender balance is one focus and one facet. But I agree that um, it is very important in innovation um, as such, and uh, I appreciate that we are focusing today on the gender. But I just would like to, to make sure that we also recall that the other flavors of diversity are equally important to have a sustainable innovation. Thank you. Uh, why am I here? I was curious. It's really by curiosity because when I was invited, I said to my husband, I said, I bet you the number for women inventors is going to be dismal. He said, why don't you look at uh, what happens with the Nobel Prize? I said, that's a good idea. He said, I bet you it is bad, maybe better than the Nobel Prize. So we looked at the Nobel Prize and in physics, Men, women, 99 to 1. Medicine, 94% to 5%. Chemistry, 97% men, 2% women. Literature is a little bit better, uh, 87 men, 12% women. Peace is the best, uh, 87, 85% uh, uh, men, 15% women. For reasons I don't understand, economics is terrible. Only one woman ever won the economic. Uh, and yet you have Christine Lagarde and you have Janet Yellen. I don't understand why only one woman uh, won this uh, economic prize. And I then I looked at, uh, you know, this mathematics prize. It's a field prize. It is every four years. Almost no women. Then I thought, well, let me look at, you know, you read the Time magazine and each year they have a person uh, used to be man of the year. Then they changed the person of the year. So I looked at how many men, how many women. So let me tell you. So it's um, for men to women, it's, it's um, almost 20 to 1. But what is really disappointing is that of the few women who were there, they're either by birth or by marriage. You do not sell Amelia Earhart on the thing. You do not see Marie Curie there. And so I thought to myself, let me see how in the pattern world it reflects or not reflect what happens in the general society. And so I hope along the way today, I don't know anything about your organization. I don't know about you. And I want to know what you really think, what we can do to make it better, because I'm quite sure we need to make it better. Perfect. Thank you. Before I hand over the floor to uh, Bruno to, base, to frame the discussion in data, I want to turn to the audience and ask just a couple of you out here, what are you guys expecting from this panel discussion? Is everybody going to be shy? Am I going to have to pick on this somebody? One, yeah. Please, Maha. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, Maha Bakhit, uh, from the League of Arab State, Director of Intellectual Property Department uh, in Cairo. Um, I believe, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Waibu very much for organizing this panel discussion. I expect that uh, because we are all of us sharing the same uh, goal that to support uh, women uh, innovation and inventions and to have more numbers of women in the field of science. As the uh, professor now told us about Nobel Prize, there is no much um, number of women. So I, I expect from this panel that even to have awareness and support uh, for women invention and innovation and also uh, to work together with <coughs> WI, uh, with Waibu and with our government for the policy. Because if we do not put a policy from the state or from government for supporting women and we have more women in the field, empowering women in the field of innovation and inventions, uh, we cannot uh, create 
new generation of women that can make life better. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Dominique Nords. I work here in WIPO in Human Resources, and I'm quite curious to hear about what's happening in innovation, because we're about to launch an innovative program and piloting it with another 11 UN entities on emerging women leaders. So I'm hoping that the discussion here will actually contribute some interesting elements to our program as well. Okay, we'll come back to the audience in a few minutes. Perhaps now Bruno can follow up from what uh, Helen was telling us about statistics. I, I can offer my own uh, layperson's interpretation of economics. I can't balance my bank account, <laughs> but um, we'll hand over to, um, to Bruno to give us the real insights based on data. Okay, um, so yes, uh, certainly the uh, woman inequality is less critical in the patent world than uh, and for the Nobel Prize. That's what we, we could identify. Uh, since last year, WIPO produces uh, statistics on uh, the woman participation in international patenting. In order to be able to produce these statistics, the Economic and Statistics Division has created a worldwide gender name dictionary that now contains more than 6 million names for 182 countries. Thanks to this dictionary, we could attribute the gender for 96% of all inventors named in PCT international applications. And I will now present you the main result that we could uh, see from this new data set. Less than one third of all PCT applications filed in 2016 included at least a woman inventor. It was precisely 30%. So said differently, there are 70% of PCT applications filed that list only men inventors. So this is to show you how the gender gap is nowadays. But the encouraging news that we could find from data is that when comparing the 2016 figures with the one 10 years earlier in 2007, we could see that the number of PCT applications with women inventors has nearly doubled over that period of time. And also in terms of share, the share of 2007 was of only 23% against 30% in 2016, so this is an increase of 7 percentage points over 10 years, which is, I would say, a relatively high growth. A large proportion of this growth is on the account of applicants in China and in the Republic of Korea. Hmm. Half of applications filed by applicants from these two countries list at least a woman inventor. This is far above the 30%, the world average. And you certainly know also that applicants from these two countries have also sharply increased their use of the PCT system over the past 10 years. But beside of that, a very interesting founding also was that in each of the six regions in the world, we saw an increase in share of PCT applications with women inventors over the past decade meaning that it's in every region of the world that we saw the share increasing. This is a very encouraging message, I think. So to, to, to conclude and to summarize, I will say that the, trend, the trends are going toward more gender equality, but we are still far from gender balance. What I mean by gender balance is having a similar number of men inventor and women inventor listed in PCT applications. 
We were curious when we found these results to see when we would achieve gender balance. So we, we thought, well, let's try to extrapolate mm -hmm. the, the trend, assuming that it will keep the same pace. And we found that we will achieve gender balance just in 60 years, in 2076. Let's show you how far we, we are from there. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Um, so we see the statistics are there. Women are patenting less than men uh, from our data uh, in the international patent system. Um, patents, we know, though, are one indicator of innovative activity. Um, what does this all mean for you? Uh, if I can ask our, our panelists, what does this mean? And perhaps if you can help us draw wider conclusions as to what this means about women in innovation. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Yeah. So, Helen, would you like to start? I personally find um, the patent process actually uh, gender neutral gender indifferent. I never felt any difference uh, in the way I applied, in the way it was judged. I think if it is one place where gender did not make a difference in the award of patents, it is in the, pa in the awards, it's in the patent. It is clear that the, the number is pretty dismal, and uh, you mentioned 60 years, which is really startling. I used to work at a uh, a pharmaceutical company and what the management always said, uh, I don't care what happens after three years, either I'm fired or I'm promoted. So 60 years is a long time to be fired and to be promoted. So I, th I think what really happens is that this really reflects in general the society, the role women play and where they are in terms of the hierarchy. So. I think the problem is upstream and not at the level of the PCT. Okay, can you perhaps, uh, Daniela, what has your, been your experience with innovation and intellectual property? Well, um, I think um, every event that I have been in I'm the only woman in the event, have been uh, nominated for different awards in different uh, uh, countries as uh, MIT, as uh, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Andrew, Duke of York, and different parts, and I'm the only woman uh, in these events. So I agree with you that I don't feel different about innovation by being a woman. Um, but at the same time, I'm the only woman around. Actually, here I came to Geneva um, because I'm one of the finalists in the event of the Impact Hub in the Accelerate 2030, and I'm the only woman chosen in this event. So it reflects the reality, the role that the, that men has taken for many years, that they are the creators, they are, they are the inventors. And well, women are increasing in this role, but we are far away from, from the balance that we are looking for. If I can just stay with you for a second, you've succeeded as an innovator. Now, has being, obviously being a woman did not hinder your success as an innovator. What can your experience bring to a possible solution to rectify this imbalance? Well, I think um, was the education I received in my family. Um, my mom is like my mom and my dad um, educated me without stereotypes, without the blue and pink stereotype. Uh, I, I remember when I was a child, I received puzzles, uh, soccer balls, uh, cars, dolls, and I played with everything. And so I I, I generate some skills, like the competitive skills, the cerebral skills, uh, the skill to have relations with everyone. So I, I think that gave me the confidence to be part of 
everything without being like, oh, I'm a girl, I'm not going to make business because there are a lot of men. Like I see with uh, many women. Um, and that, uh, I think that's the point of what I'm right now. Thanks to my dad, thanks to my mom, I'm right now what I am. Yeah, I would like also to point out what uh, Daniela already said, is that um, sometimes I have the impression that uh, especially IP rights is um, received in the female world as very aggressive and competitive. And I must say for myself at least, I'm really tired of always this competition that the female has to be as good as a man or we have to more show that we are as good or even better. And this is something that is really tiring me. And um, there I think the IP rights is one form of, or patents is one form of IP, but maybe we take more the scientific papers to, to show that. So we have a lot of female um, participants at CERN, um, also in, in our hackathons, who release papers, scientific papers, because the goal is the same, in a sense. We want to secure um, the IP, but we also would like to take the, the um, advantage of sharing our knowledge and, and make it open to, to the general public. And I think this is uh, something that we can learn um, on this, what we especially see at CERN, um, that there is in, in the local uh, communities and cultures, um, and you do not need to travel far, let's say Italy, um, there are a lot of more female physicists in Italy than there is in Germany, for example. And the number of scientific papers written by a female uh, physicists from Italy is much higher than from Germany. So what can we learn from that is that um, maybe we should try to, to break down um, the burden and make um, the, the word patent not so aggressive and competitive, but try to find new ways of, of patenting or protecting um, our IP, but not having this kind of aggressive or competitive tone, on the other hand. I actually think it should be competitive. And it should be held at a high uh, level. And I think women have every ability to compete with men. We're not really talking about whether men and women in a given pattern can do it or not. We're really talking about the percentage of women and men in getting patents. I'm looking at this chart. Well, in a way, you see in Africa is 21%. In Asia is 32%. And I work in Africa a lot, and I must say, women in Africa have a very hard time. And in a way, that uh, statistics reflect not just the percentage in the workplace, but also the general culture. And I like to tell people that uh, you know, in in the in 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 in, in this women's liber thing, you have a name called Ms. Well, the language tell you a lot of things about uh, how they perceive men and women. In Chinese language, there is a way to call miss, there is a way to call missus, there's another way to call lady. And it doesn't refer necessarily to your marital status. So I go back to what I said before. I think women can compete on any level. It's a number game. And uh, we just don't have enough number uh, to go through the educational level, and we don't have enough number in the high <coughs> echelons uh, to be able to benefit from the, the pattern is just a reflection of the more generic uh, phenomena. Fair enough. If I can just go back to, there is one study um, that uh, we've seen that shows that what you were saying about scientific papers, that women uh, who are listed as authors in scientific papers tend not to appear as much mm. in the patent application. So let me provoke a question. Are you saying that the intellectual property system is, should not be a measure of, are, are we looking at the issue in, in an incorrect or biased way, that there are women in innovation because we have all of these statistics showing that women are publishing scientific papers. So what should be, how do we measure women in innovation? We've tried to do it through the patent system. Do you have any thoughts on that, perhaps, Ines? 
Mm. Yeah, I think it's um, about the recognition that drives women especially and uh, this is I think the difference between the just patenting and and the scientific paper so I don't say that um, patents are, are wrong in itself but maybe um, one needs to work on the perception and um, the framework of of how the message is transmitted to to make a change in and having more uh, female uh, people who, who pattern um, but then on the other hand maybe one could also look into more um, the new ways and uh, technologies that have been designed, like the blockchain and the smart contracts, where it's building more on, on trust and the principle of, of recognition, the posit, um, possibility to share um, safely the knowledge without risking to lose the ground for business. So maybe you just picked one example, like the patents, to, to do the measure, but maybe it needs to be a bit wider to understand the full spectrum of, of women and in innovation. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, now, the IP system, intellectual property, is obviously not just about patents. Now, Daniela, you have uh, you've developed a product, which I hope you will show us. Sure. Um, you, Ines, you have a company. Uh, I understand that it has not been you have not used any of the intellectual property rights at, available, like trademarking the name of your company, for instance. Uh, could you perhaps develop that a bit more and tell us why you have not used the, the, the tools of the IP system to help you develop your, your, your companies? Well, I developed my company. We developed a technological solution that is here um, for people with disabilities and people who are illiterate in order to, for them to communicate with anyone, anywhere. And this is how it works. So if I can show you and you hear me, uh, we recognize, we all recognize uh, the language in images, like I'm here and I don't know how to talk in French and I was yesterday trying to order a pizza and I, and I couldn't. So uh, I can say you by images, for example. Hello, my name is Juliana. I want to eat. Oh, brownie. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is an example of how it works. The, uh, I said, my name is Juliana, my name is Daniela, but it's <laughs> my sister. This, this was created because of my sister. My sister was born with a disability. So that's the reason we created this, this solution. We, don't have, we, don't ha we have right now the copyrights of our software. We don't have the trademarks and anything else. The reason why um, I think is lack of information uh, lack of resources, uh, and I can say that in my country, I'm from Colombia, as they mentioned, uh, in my country there was a campaign from the government for patents, and I applied. I the, and the answer was that I had anything to patent. So I think that we in our country had also lack of information to, to, to have the correct uh, copyright spiders and the IP we want and we have to. Ines, tell us. Yeah, so um, with the hackathons that um, we are running is we are enabling people to come together to, to be innovative, to have the innovative juices uh, flowing and to bring on the table the right set of skills and minds and ideas. Um, and this is basically where our hackathon then ends with the presentation of the first working prototype. Um, what we encourage our participants is to use uh, as much open source as we can to transmit um, the importance of uh, humanitarian innovation. And then um, I, I use in this sense um, not maybe the classical IP system, but more something which is uh, broader known in the scientific community, like sharing what we have. Um, but once the, the uh, products are um, presented in the final presentation, where you all have your in, um, invitation on your desks uh, to come and join us on, on Sunday evening, we encourage then our participants to take the ideas forward. And we have a good track record of companies and associations that have been created after our hackathons, where uh, most of our team members are part of those associations that keep the IP rights. So there is this 
we, we encourage our participants to have this open source, but we are also encouraging, um, on the other hand, that uh, entrepreneurs are taking their ideas forward and make something out of it. C can I ask you just, you, you describe the hackathons and how you work on humanitarian issues, perhaps by giving a, a, a concrete example, for instance, the ICRC example, that you guys helped develop yes. these gold bags, if you can just so people can really understand how, what role you play in promoting innovation. So um, we started with our idea in 2014 and uh, we were inspired by some friends who work for the Red Cross and have seen many, many uh, difficult situations all around the globe. Um, and their idea was basically uh, if, it could, if we could think of any system how to make a light and easy transportable fridge to cool vaccinations. So we said this is a great idea and we would like to work on this challenge and we accept this as a challenge. But when we then gathered the team around this challenge, it came quite clear that um, the team looked into the different products that need cooling. So which is food and drinks on one side, medication, vaccination on the others. But then someone also said, well, basically after natural catastrophes or after wars, you also have to chill dead bodies until they have the <coughs> possibility uh, to identify who is this person who passed away. So there is this importance of also uh, working on this part. And one team said, this is so important to our hearts because we can make a lot of influence on the people who lost their loved ones by preserving the bodies and making it more positive, uh, possible for the forensics um, to, to identify the person and return the body to the families, that they accepted the challenge to see if one could innovate body bags. So the body bags itself, it's the plastic bag who has not seen innovation since a couple of decades now. And the idea was, can modern technology be introduced into body bags um, to delay decomposition and therefore help the forensic specialists for identification? Um, and the team took it as forward as they could, um, working together then after the hackathon with the Red Cross to speak to field experts, to uh, speak to forensic experts. They have been to conferences where forensic people meet to understand really what is the need in the field. And um, they made an agreement with ICRC to produce a second and a third round of prototypes, which uh, they now have developed and uh, delivered to the Red Cross and which are currently in field testing. And they have also applied to uh, get a fund from the Humanitarian Innovation Fund, and they got this grant uh, successfully accepted. So um, this team, after the hackathon, they also said, we have to work on this topic, even though that we cannot commit full time on it, um, and we do it next to our works, and they set up an association to run this forward. And uh, some of our team members from the port are also part of this team of, of the body bags. Super, thank you. Um, Helen, can you share your experience with the uh, IP system? I, I absolutely believe in the IP system. I worked very hard to actually interview different uh, patent offices to find a lawyer, a patent lawyer that uh, uh, not only knows patent law, but also biology and the machine because what we're doing, and I'll tell you about it in a minute, involves chemistry, electronics, um, mechanics, um, plastic design. Um, fundamentally, what we try to do is to um, make the detection of uh, infectious diseases through its uh, genetic material in a very sensitive way and simple, robust, and anyone can do that. So I think you probably know that the detection of nucleic acid is extremely complex. And, and even in China today, if you were looking for the nucleic acid of an infectious disease, they have to have three rooms, one room to uh, do the sample prep, one room to do the amplification, a room to do the detection. And the centralized machine is the size of a mini car. And so what we, re and, and that reagent is so uh, fragile that you have to ship it in dry ice, which makes it totally impossible uh, in Africa or in the lower level clinics. So what we try to do is to put together a, uh, what I call the point of care system, we call it Samba because the, uh, um, the engineer liked dancing, he called it Samba, so we force fitted the simple amplification based assay. We basically reduce a complex test into the size of a, um, 
uh, coffee machine with all the reagents available and you just plug it in and you cannot put it wrong because like a Lego stick you couldn't put it wrong and it is now being used uh, in many African countries in lower level clinics but I knew what the question was about I believed and I still believe in intellectual property. And for a small company, an academic unit, we spend tremendous amount of money proportionally to not only file, but maintain in different territories. Well, there is one patent for which I actually won the, the invention, inventor of the year two years ago. It is one of those patents that is so clear cut. It's not sophisticated, nobody, it's nothing subtle about it. And a large company, absolutely infringe. Do we have the capacity to sue them? Zero. Uh, because it will cost a couple of million. The first thing they would do is uh, go and uh, invalidate our patent in this territory, in that territory. So I actually think it is one thing to file a patent to have the freedom to operate that allows you to do what you want to do. It's quite another thing to protect it from infringement by people who are much stronger with much bigger money than you have. And I know this is a meeting about women and I care deeply about that. But I also think unless we're able to protect the intellectual property, and I actually was thinking, if we don't do that, we only have one side of the coin. And I actually was thinking, why, I don't know, you must be very important people if you are here. Why don't we put together a group, uh, the, 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 the different uh, institutions or government can put together a war chest of 100 million, 200 million, it doesn't matter. And that there are other people like us or in academia, in small company, who are unable to protect their IP. To go and then, it would have needed two, three, four million dollars, which we absolutely did not have. But to really, to protect the IP, but to do it in such a way that if they get a license, if they get a royalty, that money goes back to that funding stream. So it becomes a self-perpetuating one. Because otherwise, we're really just talking about one side of the coin. And so I really plead that I don't know who you are, but that I think is a worthwhile, worthwhile thing for us to do. But today, we cannot protect ourselves. And that company knows it. It blatantly <laughs> violates it. I look at it, and there's nothing I can do. Well, that brings me to, leads me to my second question, which you partly answered, is one solution is how can we, what can we do to foster innovation ecosystems in which, in particular, women can flourish? And Daniela, you started talking about it, that it starts with the family. Um, what else do you think can be done? For me, it's like the relation, the relation between government and family. Uh, government, I, I am tired of seeing commercials or the social media, uh, like the woman is the responsible of uh, caring about the kids and caring about the kitchen and caring about all the home things. And the, the businessman is only the man. Actually, when we were um, doing the database in Hablando con Julius, uh, we were looking for all the um, all the professions, and you say businessman. You, it's not common to say businesswoman. So that that that's the point. We are always looking for the same role, the role of the men, and the examples are always the men. So I I I think that the government must. Uh, do some campaigns where their role are both, not only the women. Who, care, who take care of the kids are the women and the men, or the parents, whatever it is, yeah? But not only the, the women. Where the, where the office is in charge of a woman or, or in charge of a man. It's not only one person, it's not only one gender. And if we have more good examples about women, and about men, we get that balance. It's, it's, it's a matter of fact that 
if parents see that uh, by giving a soccer ball to a girl is okay, more, uh, more girls will have a soccer ball. Yeah. For example, in my family, we had a conversation a few months ago where my uncles and aunts say that they won't ever give a soccer ball to a baby girl. And it was like, what? Like, if I had a girl, please, the first gift you are going to give to my daughter is a soccer ball. Because, well, I don't agree that. Because there, there are many skills that a soccer ball can give you. And so we still believe in those stereotypes. And if governments don't do like a social promotion about stopping the stereotypes in this like massive publications, we won't see a change. I mean, it's true, you never hear a man saying, I wonder how I can manage my career and have a family at the same time. But anyway, Ines, um, thoughts? I do not really agree on this uh, Thing because um, I'm a mother of uh, three, my youngest is not yet one year old, and the oldest is not yet six years old. And when I returned, first of all, um, you're asked at, uh, at work, at least here in Switzerland, not if you come back to work, but when, which is, I think, as a woman, uh, very nice to see that uh, you are treated uh, equally as your, your um, colleague. And then secondly is, um, when I came back to work, we did not have a, a childcare solution for the little one because um, the infrastructure wasn't in place to take short-term um, care. So my husband took some time off and took care of my girl. And he's working with a UN organization here as well. And he had, for example, the pram with him in Palais des Nations, um, having joining a Skype meeting on the phone while pushing the pram towards uh, the Parc uh, Prigny here. So um, I think we have to see that uh, the, the role models are changing and the family models are changing and there I see a lack of adaptation to, to the real needs that are currently there. Because I mean, we are comparing here Switzerland, which is already very good in, in child care. There is a lot of uh, crashes and, and kindergarten facilities. But um, when you then take again the Swiss prices, uh, it's not affordable. Either um, I go work uh, to pay my childcare facilities or I stay at home to take care of my family. And uh, there I see a big um, advantage now in, in fostering the ecosystem to accommodate these needs. And I don't think this is certainly a women's need, but it's a family need and also something um, where the men can help to break this uh, stereotype and the silo. Helen, you, your experience is quite unique on this panel in the sense that you've worked in, in the corporate sector, in the public sector, in academia. Can you share your thoughts on how you saw that women were perhaps encouraged to be innovators within the three different sectors? I'll share with you two experiences. One is when I was in Abbott. Um, this, all of a sudden, the government uh, uh, contract are asking that any uh, the company that can um, uh, bid for the contract must show that uh, the demographic of the company in different levels from low to high reflect men and women and reflect the minority, the racial uh, composition. So my boss had a number of business units and I was in charge of one business unit. It's about 100 people. It's one of the smaller business units. So they did for the first time a kind of a, a, a statistics to see how many men, how many women, what minority in different levels. Well, it turns out my business unit reflected almost perfectly to the, the demo, demography. And my boss was really happy. He said, great, Helen, you're delivering this system to me. How did you do it? I said, Jay, you'll have to tell me that the women is not as good as men and the minority not as good as a white man to explain my statistics. I didn't do anything. I honestly didn't do anything. And so for this, for this meeting, I actually uh, called my uh, patent lawyer. I said, Neil, how we have about 15 patents, quite a number of uh, applicants. So I said, tell me, how many are men and how many are women? 
Well, it turns out 62% are women. And I, I was startled. He said, this is quite unique. I said, well, Neil, I can't figure out why. I certainly didn't do anything about it. It isn't like I'm saying you're a woman, let's do that. We finally figure out that the reason is that I didn't just have the women at the lower level that does what the boss says, do this, so they're not the inventor because they're just executing. But that, in fact, the women were there at different levels, and they are just as capable of deciding what experiments to do, and therefore, naturally, they are inventors. So I go back to what I said earlier. It is not about the perception of women. There are plenty of fantastic women role models. And I think the world is changing. It is really the fact that women are not represented in equal proportion in higher levels. And, and I think that probably is the most important thing. If that can be the case, then I think everything will reflect that quite naturally. And so I, I don't know. I think in the end you're going to ask, what will the people do? Well, maybe it's a survey and ask what, the, what the, the institution would do to make women available in the higher level, which really means it's a big elephant in this room as people don't talk about that. Women have babies. They have to have babies, they need to go off the working trail, and they, they, it's very difficult to bring up children. And even though many men are more willing, nevertheless, it is by nature and by design, women want to be with the babies. So during this period of a few years, it's really very difficult for them to maintain in the career path. I think what I did, and don't think I'm a woman's liber, I'm not. Sometimes when, when somebody's pregnant again, I say, ah, oh, no, not again. <laughs> I can say that and quite jokingly, because it's very inconvenient, they're so good. But what, <laughs> what, what we did is actually maintained her place by the whole group taking more and more of her responsibility when she becomes less and less available and keeping her in touch with what we're doing. When she comes back, we give her back the things piece by piece. And I must say, I have some of the fantastic women in my group, and it is not about women's lib. It's not about the prejudice, not about what the society should do. It has to do with capturing the talent of women that the society is losing if we don't do this. Um, before I open the floor to some questions, um, just Bruno, since we were talking about this question about um, you know, the, the statistics, do you have specific data on women participation uh, that distinguishes between women participation in the business sector and academia? Is there a difference there? And which technical fields are women filing more patents in, just so we get an idea of that demography? Yeah, sure. Yes, we, we have... Uh we have data for, for these two um, topics. First, regarding the, the business sector and the academia, <coughs> of course, uh, the business sector files about 90% roughly of PST applications. So um, obviously the vast majority of women that are listed in PST applications come from the business sector. But uh, when you look, uh, what is interesting is looking at the share of PST applications with women in inventors within these two categories of applicants. Again, because 90% uh, are from the business sector, the share for the business sector is 29%, is very close to the 30%, the overall share. But more interestingly is the one from the academia, where we see that 51% of PST applications uh, include uh, women inventors from the academia in 2016. So it's quite high share. Um, regarding the fields of technology, uh, here it's uh, mainly the, the, where we see the highest share of PST applications with women inventor, it is in life science, mm -hmm. which uh, it would be the field of biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, organic fine chemistry, 
Uh, we have two others, food chemistry and analysis of biological materials, all having uh, shares above 50% of um, the applications with women inventors. Uh, the one with lowest will be in uh, mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. I'd like to um, open the floor now for some questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to volunteer a, a couple of questions. I understand that we have um, colleagues from the Republic of Korea and the Dominican Republic who would like to share examples of what their IP offices are doing to promote and reach out to more women innovators. So if they are still in the room, by a show of hands. Yes, please, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I'm very happy to have this opportunity to uh, share our case, our case experience as to how to enhance the capacity of the woman's invention. Ratio of women inventors uh, in Korea seems to be very high, and I think lots of the factors would be related to these outstanding statistics. I would like to mention two major things with cause high ratio of women's inventions. First of all, Korea provides a very favorable environment for women's invention. I, would, uh, I think uh, most of you have already seen uh, the movie of the Joey, whose main character is Jennifer Offense who made a great success through the invention of the cleaning mop. Even if the story is based on the real story, however, I was very surprised that RK has a very similar story. A very famous woman uh, inventor <coughs> invented the so-called steamed vacuum, which has the function of sterilization by using high temperature gas, which made a slam dunk. <laughs> I would like to say that in Republic of Korea, we can easily find a very good precedent of a very successful woman's invention. Further, a lot of the women are studying or working in the university related to science, laboratories, and the companies are in the sector. In addition, I'm very proud of that. We have a lot of the private sectors, such as Korean Women Inventors Association, we can, who can provide the support and assistance to the women's inventors. Secondly, I would like to mention that Republic of Korea's policy and activities to the promotion of the women's inventors. The Korean Intellectual Property Office provides assistance for commercialization of a woman's good idea. Further, we also provide support for patent applications for their ex exclusive right under the umbrella of the providing support to small, small and medium-sized enterprise. Further, the Korean Intellectual Property Office holds the ex exhibition uh, of women's inventions along with the private sector. Through this regular exhibition, lots of the women inventors, including my two daughters, are able to keep up with the new invention trend or social experience. In sum, the women's invention, like a standard vacuum, greatly contributed to Republic of Korea's economic growth. This is the reason why the Republic of Korea have fully supported and will support the women's invention. Thanks for listening. Thank you, sir. Please, I'm happy that we are discussing issues that relate to empowering women innovators. As Uganda, we have done so many activities in ensuring that women innovators or innovations that relate to women are done by women are, are protected, are commercialized, and the violations of rights are enforced. I am the director in charge of intellectual property, and we have done so many activities to promote women inventors. Uh, first, we have done workshops with the Women Association of Uganda. It's called the Uganda Women Entrepreneurs Association, which has uh, close to 2,000 members, of which all are women. So we hold workshops with them to promote their business enterprises, but also their intellectual property assets. And we are moving even beyond the city to the uh, villages to ensure that women uh, uh, rights are protected. We have also recently engaged the uh, women that play a role in traditional knowledge and folklore. We had a regional workshop that was supported by WIPO. And we had so many women in medicine women in, uh, uh, that are 
uh, making products for the skin, for the complexion, for health, uh, that were advised to uh, uh, take part in their protection of uh, TKs. We have also looked at the young innovators in the last uh, IP uh, day uh, uh, of, 20, uh, of this year, 2017 in April, we had an innovations award where we are looking at different sectors, medicine, chemistry, arts, and uh, all, all, all the different clusters. And we had so many young women innovators, and we did award uh, some of them because they excelled in the exhibitions. We as a, a country are also a very uh, uh, concerned and, and very, uh, about uh, gender issues. Uh, Uganda is one of the countries that promotes women. Many of us have gone to school. Many of us have uh, high positions. And in our office, we are actually more women than a men. We are about close to 70%, if not 68%. And we also work with the Uganda Law Society Association we, uh, to promote the women in law. We also work with the women innovators to promote the women innovation. So we have decided to partner with the key players, the associations, because they have the people, they have the women. They mobilize and we come and talk to them. And lastly, we also hold our clinics, mobile clinics, moving from one place to another with our mobile vans talking to people about the importance of protecting innovations. And even when we go on radio and all these publicity and media coverages, we make sure that we pick our people from the private sector to uh, appear with us uh, as government on these stations for public confidence and trust. And we call upon all our nations or all member states and observers to take the issues of women as seriously by ensuring that our offices position ourselves to promote uh, the role of women in innovation and the role of women in business. I thank you so much. Since we heard from what an IP office is doing and uh, quite extensively, perhaps I can give the floor to my colleague uh, from the SMEs division at WIPO to say a few things that WIPO is doing in the area. Well, I just wanted to make a short comment. When we speak about women and innovation, patent is just the first step. And that's where we are still finding women in academic applications that they are equal or almost equal to the men. Where we are losing women is in the path of commercialization. And that's where we are very much concerned and we are right now undertaking two studies in Asia, in Philippines and in Sri Lanka, trying to identify root causes. Why is it, uh, is it something in prejudice, in stereotypes? But you can easily imagine a woman which is, for example, um, proposing to the family to put a mortgage on their house for creating her own business. Everybody would say, but she has a husband or she has a children. So there are still prejudices which are impeding us even being very inventive, very creative. So women are equally participating in inventions, but not in commercialization. That's where we are losing our roles. They are not uh, CEOs, they are not top managers, because it's a, it's a risky business for a woman. If you look also, uh, we did a study uh, following the women in academic, with academic career, with uh, great inventions, would they follow it further to, uh, to, to set up a startup, even startup, which is considered these days as a relatively simply to establish. They would never leave secure career in the academic environment for venturing in something which would put in a jeopardy, in a, in a, uh, in a way um, which may put in a risk her family and the fund which is needed for the development of a family. So it is the issue that we are very much concerned. About five years ago, we started in our evaluations to, uh, to, co uh, to collect data about presence of women on a different level of innovation. And we have interesting uh, conclusions, but it is not a study. We are just recuperating, making the databases. And now we decided to do two studies in, uh, we are sponsored by uh, Fit Australia in Philippines and in Sri Lanka to see where the women are lost in this path 
from a good idea invention to uh, to the uh, to the commercialization to the market. Thank you. Yes, from the Dominican Republic. I I am actually the director of the of the intellectual property office. As as white power representative for women affairs, knows, we've been involved in the last uh, two two and a half years in trying to break the tendency in our country as part of Latin America, especially the um, Central America and Dominican Republic region. We have a very serious gap in terms of uh, innovation. It's very, very serious. And we have a serious gap in STEM careers. So I kind of agree with uh, Dr. Lee that once you do <coughs> things, they naturally tend to flow toward women and men naturally. Since we are beginning to promote, and we cannot make any distinctions, we cannot afford, we have to incentivate everybody because we have to teach everybody. But it naturally, the, the turnout has been like we have, for example, a project, a pilot project that is now going to be adopted by the Ministry of Education. We're still continuing with that pilot project because what an office like ours so small can do is just to try to awaken the other policy makers. Because sometimes there are things, we only register. We cannot make the inventors or the innovators. The system has to make them. But then since the system is not making them, we have to wake them up and make them realize how important it, this is for the economy. So this is what we're doing. So in trying to have a higher profile for innovations and inventions for the whole population, then women and men are targeted equally. But what has been the result? For example, we have a camp which is a, is called a camp, it's sort of a camp invention. It's called Innovation Summer. It's for high school, uh, high, uh, high with, that have shown, even by their grades or by their abilities that have been focused by the directors at the public schools, that they have some tendency that could be useful in STEM careers. Previously, those kids will go to any humanistic careers, even though they are talented. So we're trying to screen them and to, in four months of intensive, intensive exposure to innovation, hands-on, in a lab, in companies, to see things they have not seen in their public schools, they can make a choice. And then we explain to them, you have a talent. And then your country needs your talent. You, We have enough lawyers. I don't want any lawyer to be offended. But your country's needing engineers. And you know how many, what's the proportion of, of females in that? that were selected because they are selected with a criteria that unfortunately involves grades, 70% were women. And you know the results? 80% made a choice for STEM uh, professions, which is we, there are some of these professions that they didn't, they, they were almost orphaned. They were about to close, like chemistry. And in doing these little things, we always, teach them intellectual property with, a, with an idea, an association with the Korean fund, a, trying to make it, uh, make the child, or the, they're not children, to focus in problem and solution. And then after, I find my solution registration. It's a, a Korean model that we have been benefiting series of that. So as you see, it naturally comes if you, if we, have the enough numbers, as Dr. Lee say, say, it will come. But in the t in meantime, we need some, we can suggest some positive actions in funding, like to speed up the process. If we are going to have funds, like L'Oreal funds, we only have that fund. Okay, we can have a positive action. For, for these women. In terms of spin-offs, spin-offs are difficult for everybody, women or men or, you know, and in terms of commercialization, it's always better to have a strong man, a means of a business, not as a female or a male. It's 
a strong company. Well, companies are male or female, where they don't have any gender. Because when you have a partner with you, then you can defend yourself, because he's defending also his interest. Going alone to spin-offs is very, very risky for women, for men, for everybody. So I, I think that what we need to also try to have these skills in the whole population of inventors is better to have a piece of a cake that is surely that is going to be a piece of a cake than pretending to have the whole cake for yourself because you're the sole patent owner. Because afterwards, in litigations, you don't have the money. So in the beginning, if you have something that's commercial value, there will be a partner for that. And it doesn't have to be a man, or it doesn't have to be a female. It's going to be a company which doesn't have any gender. And it's a very important decision, because everybody that has an idea and has a patent, they think they have a commercial thing. Most patents don't reach market. Even specifically, like I come from the pharmaceutical sector, 70% of patents fail. So this must be very clear so that we avoid women having false expectations like if I'm, if I'm not doing well with this spin-off, it's because I'm a woman. It, must, it could also be, have you check that this has commercial value, that somebody wants this. If somebody wants this, you will surely have a company or, or a fundraiser or something that will go through <coughs> with you and you will share the risk. I think sometimes we use the, um, we prototype also and say if, we f if something went wrong it's because I'm a female. It's difficult for everybody. Spinners are very difficult and also SMEs are very difficult. I, I just wanted to share this experience that we're having in, and I do, uh, we promote the role of women through newspaper articles, like our news department will surely contact you to interview, because this part of, prom of seeing the social role of women that are successful, like you in IT. We are trying to bring uh, a movement that's called Women Who Code, you know that, in, from, from United States to our country, to show girls, since they are very early, that coding is not that difficult. So I, I hope that some of you could be available for the programs that we are developing because we do need these role models to be shown to our population of women. 60% of women in, in, uni in universities population in my countries are, are women. So the numbers are changing and those trends will continue to balance. I, I'm very optimistic about it. I understand that Helen has a question to ask the audience as well. Yeah, I have a question to ask you. You must come from different countries and different institutes. And as part of the preparation for this, I actually did a survey of something like 10, 12 women in their 30s. And they would be middle management. If they had stayed at work, they would be top management because they're that good. They happen to be childbearing age, right? So I asked them, what is their problem? What do they expect their institution to do? Without exception, they all said they want flexibility at work. So they can do part-time. They would like to be able to work, uh, get paid off normal working hours because sometimes they can only work on the weekend or in the evening. And even their husband asked for flexibility from the workplace so they can share. It's not all men who are male chauvinist pigs, and they, they, they want to share with the childbearing. They feel as guilty as women do not being spending enough time with their children. And so, so from this survey, it was very clear to me that the flexibility of the workplace to preserve their career trajectory 
is not really there. If it had been there, then they will come back into the working workplace and uh, carry on. I mentioned earlier that uh, the, the pattern percentage in, in my group, the women, they're 67 percent. It's because they are in the higher echelons and they decide what experiments to do. They become inventors. So my question for you is how many of you, coming from all kinds of countries and different institutions, do you have a institution that really is flexible and to allow women to really come through to be as the high level with the same percentage as they were in the lower percentage. I'd like to know who among you say, my institution is that. Show, show of hands? I bet you it's zero or two <laughs> or one, maybe. And there lies the problem or oh, one of the big problems, right? Why do you say yours is so perfect? So if I good? am, if like I am right, right I, I, I understand your question. You're asking about whether uh, in, in our countries there is a woman in a no. lead, leader or? No, I meant in where you work, mm -hmm. that the proportion of women at lower level is similar to women in the higher level. In other words, there is not such a pyramid. As you go up, more and more men are at the top. And that is really why, if you look at a uh, uh, friend of me, my lawyers, uh, my patent lawyer said, well, Helen, it's really very simple. There are more men at the higher level. They, the more women are doing things, and the men are directing things. And that's why they become inventors and the, the other women are just doing their work. I cannot think of any other way to explain the statistics. I promise you I didn't do anything to make women more whatever. It's just that it reflects the demography of men and women. So I wanted to know, any of you can tell me your institution is flexible, is woman-friendly, child-bearing friendly, and take care of the women's career uh, higher up. What did you actually um, mean by being flexible? Well, for example, the, the, sometimes uh, the, the flexibility these women are asking, I, I can tell you because I don't have children, but th they're telling me what flexibility they have. They would like to be able to work part-time, job sharing, and that they would like to be paid uh, at off hour work because they cannot do the eight to five or if the kid is sick or something like that. So, and they want to be able to also participate with the, the husband. So, and, and having enough crash that is high quality and not so expensive. It turns out they actually have an economic hardship when they are working part time and, and often they're paying what they earn is gone to the babysitter. So they were asking for this kind of flexibility from the workplace, so to preserve them the opportunity to participate fully while they are going through the childbearing age so that they can come back and be at the higher echelon. That's what I meant. That's what they meant. We do I, th I think what we're saying here is that professional well-being and personal well-being need to be aligned. Yeah. And the question that Helen is saying, and it goes back to what can we all do to create innovation ecosystems that allow women to thrive. And what we're saying from Helen's experience is that the, the place of work needs to give the flexibility to women to be able to flourish and participate equally. Uh, as, as men, taking into account the, the fact that women have families, have children, and take time off work, if I summarize yes, correctly. Yes, yes. Uh, I think Daniela would like to say something too, please. Yes. I. <laughs> well, my company is a small company, but we have all the flexibility for women and men. 
like if you want and you, you can work part time it's okay if you need to go to the doctor it's okay like there is no an hour to 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 start working and an hour to stop working it's just like the responsibility everyone has mm -hmm. and um, that's how we work if we see in, in our company the three highest uh, charges <laughs> i don't know how to say it uh, uh, we are three women in, in those. Uh, so it's, it's like thinking about that we are humans, that it is not only what we do is working and working and working, that we have uh, our family, just a dad, a mom, and a, a grandma that who, who can be sick, or a pet, or whatever. Who, who, we, we, we are not right now in a world that we have to be sitting down and being on a desk in front of a, of, of a single computer. We can be everywhere and everywhere we can work. And that will change many things uh, in 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 the in in women or in the gender gap. Thank you. Um, I just understand we have uh, a friend who has been working to promote gender equality in agricultural research. Would you like to say a couple of things about that? Yeah. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. I apologize for being um, late, but this is such an exciting conversation. I'm so glad it's happening. Um, it is so definitely time. Uh, my name is Wanjiro Kamau Rutenberg, and I run an organization called African Women in Agricultural Research and Development. And our mandate is around building a more gender responsive agricultural research ecosystem for the African continent. Our flagship work is the Award Fellowship, which is a two-year career development fellowship for women agricultural scientists across the continent. So far, we've invested in about 500 women scientists directly through the fellowships, and then an additional 1,000, both men and women who have been mentors to the fellows that we support. And then each award fellow is then required to identify a junior woman scientist that they mentor through their career growth. In some of the conversations that I've walked into, what's exciting me is the things you're talking about are the exact issues that we're talking around agricultural research. Um, for us in Africa, agricultural research is a huge sector of the, the the broader research agenda and so being able to to have these kinds of transformations in science um in how science gets done is really important and i also want to just emphasize what you what i'm hearing you say about institutions and the role that institutions can play in building a conducive work culture and i just also want to emphasize that when you in some of our work beyond the fellowship is supporting agricultural research institutions become places where both men and women can thrive and innovate. And what usually happens is if you have an institution that is catering to the needs of women, then that is ins institution is almost by default catering to the needs of a whole, a whole host of categories of innovators, including men and young men who are becoming fathers in social settings where men are expected to engage more in parenting. And so you're seeing young men also facing similar pressures around how they balance work, how they achieve work-life balance. So to the extent we then drive a sector-wide response that, yes, makes it's easier for women to innovate. Those benefits accrue across the system to both men and, and women. Um, and then finally, just to clo close off by saying it does, and, and I'm sure this is preaching to the choir, but it really doesn't make sense for us to play with half a team by running innovation systems where only men are able to bring their best to the table. For the kinds, and certainly within the African context, for the kinds of problems that we need science and innovation to solve, it really then makes sense to play with a full team to make it possible for both men and women to innovate and bring their best 
solutions to the table. So this isn't really about favoring women. It's actually about allowing ourselves to benefit from the full talent. And we know talent is equally distributed, but access to opportunity is not. So to the extent that we then expand access to opportunities so that the talent that is equally distributed rises to the top, then we all benefit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a few more minutes uh, left. I want to give maybe a chance to our panelists to, as I said, we have a captive audience to basically say one or two things that you would like the policymakers and the people sitting in this room to um, take home and to see how we can better promote innovation uh, among women. Daniela? Well, in my case, I think innovation is about everything. Like, it's not about creating a technology. It's about innovating how the place, uh, the working place is doing right now how uh, we understand the person needs, what, what the other person needs, um, and how, uh, how we feel as humans and how ca can we collaborate together to be part of the same um, company. That's how I see uh, technology, that's how I see, I see my company, that's how me and all the, the, the people who works with me uh, are cons uh, we are constructing a, a different culture in which everyone first is a human and then is a worker. And because of that, women and men are equal. And women and, mer and men, are, uh, I also agree, are equal talented. But uh, if we give the same opportunities to both of them, we will have uh, what we expect, uh, that is the gen to and the gender gap. So what I already mentioned um, in the beginning is um, where I see myself good at is uh, generating ideas and bringing the right people uh, to the table to, to innovate. But what we are as an association as well are not very good at is um, the incubation part of um, the ideas because uh, as we already heard it's not about having ideas but to bring it forward and maybe there is a chance uh, for a more family friendly or child care friendly setup of innovation and this is not as we heard before not only touching women but also touching the men who want to become more um, engaged in the family and in the role model of the father. Um, as we heard, um, the new family types are kind of more fluid and um, there is a clear need of uh, incubation where uh, is a lot of flexibility, not only for women, but also for men to, to take up their family roles and um, to promote that. Um, and one part which is crucial for me is also the funding. Um, I'm working a lot with uh, social entrepreneurs and um, the market niche is quite small and also the, um, if you come with a product like with the body bags before, there is clearly a need for body bags, unfortunately, but the margin is so limited that you cannot make a sustainable business out of that. And um, when we are going back to Maslow and to the pyramid of needs, um, I have to secure my family and my, my basic needs first. And then later on, I can think of IP and, and other things. But I first have to, to secure me, myself, and my family. So um, I think there is a clear need of, of having accessible, easy funding um, in order to have more spo space for ideas and then certainly also to think about IT and patenting and, and the sum. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would be very disappointed if we just go away and had a nice moan. Uh, <laughs> I was actually not surprised, although a little bit surprised, that nobody in this room raised their hands to say their institution is, well, maybe one or two. Okay, <laughs> fine, great. <laughs> so you're the exception. That, so it is a general reflection even of your gen generic um, ecosystem. 
So I actually was wondering, uh, I, I don't know enough about the politics here, but the DG was here. What if you go back to your institution uh, and in one of the th uh, answer I got in my um, survey was that the management, the top management, are all in their 40, 50. They've forgotten what it is like to have childbearing age and the women's need. And so I actually wonder whether it is possible as an action item that come out of this meeting that you go back to your institution to have a survey. There must be women, men, and say from your institution shouldn't take that much effort for them to really uh, assess how friendly your own institution is to women inventors or to patent, to whatever, to a career. And maybe that in itself is something concrete that uh, maybe the upper management can think about it and even come up with some concrete suggestions. It really would be a shame after all this, we just go back and go back to there our own way. Some action, some meaningful action should come out of this meeting. Well, thank you. I think now I'd just like to wrap up, uh, thank our panelists for making the time to be with us today, flying in from, from far and, and driving in from, from neighboring France as well. Um, just as, as a word of summary, I think uh, it's very hard to summarize everything that happened in this uh, discussion, which was quite interesting. But I guess if I can say it in a nutshell, first of all, we should begin inspiring girls from a very young age. Perhaps uh, when we see a girl, uh, we, we sometimes hear this, when a girl is acting up, instead of saying she's bossy, we can say she has good leadership skills. <laughs> and it starts there. Um, encourage innovation at an early age, not to distinguish between boys and girls. The education system has a big role to play. Uh, professional networks do need to be more flexible to encourage and inspire innovation and support innovation um, from both uh, men and women. And uh, we can show more outreach uh, in, 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 in the IP system from IP offices, from WIPO, from other institutions to promote more diversity in, in innovation in the innovation ecosystem. So thank you very much, and uh, we hope to continue the discussion formally, informally, amongst ourselves and elsewhere. Thank you very much.